Good morning, everyone. It is so good to be together today, and uh, it's a surprising number of people here in person. It's great to have these smiling faces, some, uh, some behind masks, some without masks, and that's great. We are, want everybody to be comfortable and uh, safe. So it's great to be together on this third Sunday in Lent. I invite you to join in our processional hymn. If I could get our uh, title screen up. It's number 446 in your hymnal, Word of God, Come Down on Earth. Please stand. Welcome. Please be seated. Okay, let's try it again. Am I am I on the speakers here? Okay. I can't I can't hear myself through these. I think uh, there we go. We got it. And I trust that those online can hear me just fine. If not, uh, feel free to send a chat message. So it's great to be together in worship on this third Sunday in Lent. Thank you so much to a few of our faithful folk who have helped prepare our service for us. Today we have Russ, our lay reader here with us. Linda is helping on sides. Uh, Marilyn is zooming in online to do our scripture readings today. Thank you to Jeremy on Zoom and uh, Isaiah is helping out with sound. Thank you to Travis there as well. And uh, Michael uh, selected our music and I think was is helping with our vocals as well as Lois, thank you. Great to see you guys in your choir gowns. Uh, better watch out, there'll be talk of the choir uh, emerging again. Uh, good to see Amy on organ, thank you so much. And we do have our Sunday school teachers today. We have uh, Erica and Kirsten Olson are leading our youngest and middle groups and the grade fives and sixes will be staying in the church for the service today. Thank you to Graham, Carson and Claire, our acolytes and Donna and Bev for our altar guild duties today. Without further ado, let us begin our worship with the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 
Let us say together the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father of mercy, alone we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. When we are discouraged by our weakness, strengthen us to follow Christ, our pattern and our hope, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us remain being seated as we listen to God's word in Holy Scripture. It's okay, okay. The first reading is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 1 to 9. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen, so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that he may have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm appointed for today is a selection of Psalm 63. We will have our cantor lead the first verse, and we will follow with the underlined verses. Oh God, you are my God, eagerly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a barren and dry land where there is no water. Therefore I have gazed upon you in your holy place, that I might behold your power and your glory. Is better than life itself. My lips shall give you praise, so will I bless you as long as I live. And lift up my hands in your name. My soul is content as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth praises you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the night watches, for you have been my helper. And on 
under the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My soul clings to you. Your right hand holds me fast. Please remain seated for a second reading. The second reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 13. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us, so that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not become adulter idolaters as some of them did. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them to serve as an example. And they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No test has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be God. Please stand for our gradual hymn, number 179, Tree of Life and Awesome Mystery. And we will be singing verses 1, 3, 5, and 6D. <laughs> So with you. The Holy Gospel of Lord Jesus Christ is written in the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, beginning at the first verse. Glory, Glory to you, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. At that very time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because of these Galileans suffered in this way, 
they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the tower fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the other living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year, until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Any kids who are here are welcome to come up for a children's talk. Great job, Carson and Claire. Great job, Graham. So good to see you. Some regulars and some, some new folks. Good to see you. Oh, it's so great to have you guys with us today. Today, we read a, a very interesting story from the Gospels. It's not the most pleasant of stories about Jesus. But you know what? Sometimes Jesus had comforting words, and sometimes Jesus had challenging words, right? The passage we read today was about repentance. Anyone know what repentance means, Carson? That's part of it, asking God for forgiveness. Yeah, part of the way that we can repent is through God's forgiveness, that we trust that we will be welcomed if we turn and turn back to him. So repentance has to do with turning. So if I am walking this way, like this, and I repent, it means I turn all the way. Anyone here in math class in school? Do you know the degrees of a circle? Graham, you've learned about degrees. How many degrees in a circle? 360. So if I do a 360 degree turn, I'm looking back at where I started, right? But what, what do you think repentance is? How many degrees? Graham. 180, right, 180 degree turn. You're turning away from that thing that was not good. And the other half of it is you're turning towards something. And so I really like today how we read the passage from Isaiah. Did you guys listen to that passage? It had an amazing vision of what the kingdom of God is meant to be like. And you know, a main part of that, it was talking about how people with no money can come and have their needs fulfilled. What a strange idea with the world that we live in. Hey, guys, where everything that we need has to take money, right? Wouldn't it be amazing if we could live in a place where the amount of money we had wouldn't make a difference? How are, what are some ways that we can live kind of like that now? What do you guys think? How can we live as though money is not the number one concern? Pretty soon we're going to be bringing that plate at the back up to the front. You guys know what that plate's for? Lucas? Uh, putting, money. putting money in, yeah. So that's one way we can do it. We do that every Sunday. We share our goods and our money. Graham? 
Yeah, donations, yeah, for people to donate money. And there's lots of other good causes around too that support people that don't require payment, right? So they're called charities. Did you guys know that there's a place called the food bank in town? The food bank takes in donations of food and money, and then they give food and supplies and clothes and things like that to people that need them. And they don't even require any sort of payment. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, so that's what, another way we can live as though money is not the number one thing, that we can support organizations that care for those and don't require payment. So for people that are poor, they can have their needs met. Well, I challenge you guys to think of different ways that you can live so that you can live as though money is not the most important thing in this world. Try to think of ways that you can live that way this week as you go from this place. So I'm going to say a quick prayer for you before you go to Sunday school. Actually, our youngest ones and our middles will go to Sunday school and our grades five and sixes will stay in the church. So let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for these wonderful kids. Help us to help them to grow into your mature image that you've created for them to be. Help us to know how to lead them, how to parent them, how to support them, and how to teach them. Most of all, help us to live our lives in a way that will inspire them. We pray for these kids as they go to Sunday school that they would learn and to grow and follow in your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you guys, God bless you as you go to Sunday school. Kirsten and Erica are in the hall, I believe. Or Erica's right here, she'll lead you. I speak to you today in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I've been here at St. Stephen's over five years now, and I remember when I first came here and I started getting to know the parish, I realized something that was a little concerning to me. We had a mission statement that in many ways was and is great, but it said nothing about discipleship. In fact, we still have the same mission statement because people didn't want to revisit it, even if we don't really talk much about it. In fact, the only place it is posted is in a closet in the hall. And just, just to be clear, it wasn't me who put it there. I won't go through our mission statement today line by line, but it contains nothing about our identity as disciples of Jesus. It says nothing about us being students of Jesus as people who are constantly on a learning journey to know and to follow Jesus more and more closely. At the time, I kind of let it slide, and our leadership team over the years has focused our energies on other necessary issues. But today in my sermon, my message is a message for disciples. It's not for the weak-hearted. That's because Jesus' words in our reading today are not for the weak-hearted. Jesus tells us in our reading today, that all people are sinners who deserve death. All people are sinners who deserve death. Let those who can hear, hear. It's important as disciples, as those on the road to serving God, that we know what we are getting ourselves into from the get-go. If you go into this life of discipleship with airy-fairy notions of people being generally good, not only will you struggle to see a need for any kind of redemption in the world and the kind of salvation that Jesus brings, you'll also go about your life on this earth being continuously disappointed. It seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? That so-called positive thinking actually will lead you to more disappointment. Many people who do what they can to think highly of human nature do so because they think it will help them to have a positive outlook and a positive experience of life. I know this because when I started off on my own Christian journey about 25 years ago, this was me. 
And I've known many, many people along the way who think the same. Today, I'm preaching the kind of sermon I wish someone had preached to me 25 years ago. When it comes to a Christian disciple's outlook on human nature, it's more positive in the grand scheme of things to set your expectations low, to have your eyes wide open and clear going into working with people. That way, you'll actually be willing to address the darkness in this world, to face it and to bring the light of Christ into it. In order to understand this passage we read from Luke 13 today about humanity being sinful and deserving of death, I believe it's good to be reminded of what comes in Luke 14, the very next chapter. That is where Jesus talks about how wise people sit down and prepare before starting something. If you're building a tower, he says, make sure you sit down, you sit down beforehand and make sure you have all of the materials needed to finish the project. And if you're a king considering going to war with another nation, sit down first to consider whether you might be outgunned. If so, Jesus says, work out a treaty for peace or you will soon regret it. Today in our reading from chapter 13, Jesus is teaching a crowd of people, some of whom bring up a horrific story to Jesus. It's a story of Jesus' own countrymen, fellow Galileans, who went up to the temple to make sacrifices and for whatever reason, were slain by Pilate's soldiers in the very act of offering their sacrifice to God. The implication is that these faithful Galileans were doing exactly what God commands, and at that very moment, God allowed them to be slain. Their question was really, why do bad things happen to good people? And Jesus' response is basically to say, there are no good people. He says this, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way that they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Jesus basically says that we all deserve what comes to us and that the only way to be spared, at least for a time, is to repent. Now, the good news in this passage is that repentance is possible. It's possible not of ourselves, but of God through Christ's Holy Spirit working in us. And what is repentance? I just described it a bit for the kids. It's the act of turning away from sin in our lives. Now remember that Jesus is not a Cartesian. He doesn't have our modern ideas of our minds being somehow separate from our bodies. To a first century Jew, there was no separating these things like our modern Protestant concerns might have about how our thoughts about Jesus may or may not save us apart from our outward behaviors. That's not applicable here. Jesus wasn't a Protestant or a Catholic. To Jesus, repentance was repentance. Turning away was turning away. The more basic question the text text answers for us is the one that we share with people throughout the ages. Why do bad things happen to good people? And Jesus tells us, there are no good people. This is a claim that people will do everything they can to get away from. But your relationship to this claim will condition your future path as a disciple of Jesus Christ. If you believe it, you will see need for redemption in the world. You'll see the reason why the early disciples left all that they had to follow Jesus. You'll see the reason why the apostles left their homes and traveled to faraway lands to tell people about Jesus and the redemption that he offers. If people are just fine where they are, there is no need for redemption. There's no need for missionaries to spread the good news. Now, I do need to put an asterisk here, because in this day and age, we need to keep in mind the negative side to missionary work. When the missionaries start thinking that they are somehow better than those they're ministering to and conflate the mission of salvation with their Western developed culture. That colonial mentality is actually the opposite of what I'm talking about here today. 
Because if we truly internalize that there are no good people, we ourselves get lumped into that. And our culture cannot be held up as somehow superior because it's just as much composed of people who are sinful and in need of continual repentance. If there's a heresy the colonialists were guilty of, it was of a faulty understanding of conversion, a kind of one and done mentality. They underestimated the need for repentance to be a continual practice in the life of a disciple because there are no good people, not even ourselves. If we as Christian disciples start out with that understanding and expectation, we can still hope for the best. We hope that ourselves and others are living continual lives of repentance, but we will also prepare for the worst. We will foresee the risks of working with people. We will put into place standards for both ourselves and others to keep us accountable because we all fall into sin. The outcome for such a community of clear-eyed disciples will increasingly be a community that is Christian, a place that is safe for the vulnerable. Safe for all of us who are vulnerable to sin and safe for those who are at risk of abuse because the human powers that be will be kept in check. That is not possible if our communities just assume that everyone has good intentions. So fellow disciples, let us root out these weak-minded ideas of good human nature because they're not serving anyone, least of all those who are most vulnerable in our community. Let us instead do the hard work of discipleship in ourselves, in our life together as a parish, in our diocese, and in our world. May Jesus give us the courage to see human nature for what it is, and may we have the courage to live and to lead a life of repentance. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. Let us say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now we will invite Russ to lead us in our prayers of the people. Please kneel if you're able. With confidence and trust, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. We pray for the one holy Catholic and apostolic church throughout the world. We pray for the staff and the ministry of the Saskatchewan Anglican, our diocesan newspaper. We pray for the Right Reverend Mary Irwin Gibson, Bishop and the clergy and the people of the Diocese of Montreal. We pray for the assistant to the bishop and the staff of the Manitoba Northwestern Ontario Synod. We pray for our companion diocese, for our companion diocese in Litchfield in Mayinga, for our ecumenical partners in the Lutheran, Anglican, Ukrainian Catholic, 
and Roman Catholic covenant. We pray for the Swift Current and Area Ministerial Association. And we also pray here in Swift Current for St. Stephen's Anglican Church. We pray for the Venerable Chris and the Reverend Krista Dowdswell and their family. We pray for the church throughout all the world. Lord, have mercy. We pray for the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for those preparing for baptism and for their teachers and sponsors. We pray to you, Lord. For peace in the world, that a spirit of respect and reconciliation may grow among nations and peoples. Today we pray for all areas in our world where there is conflict. Praying especially this morning for all those in Ukraine who have lost their homes, who have lost their livelihoods. We pray especially for those who have lost loved ones and those who, those who themselves have lost their own lives. We pray that peace may be restored to our world. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for the poor, the persecuted, and the sick, and all who suffer, for prisoners, refugees, and all in danger. We pray especially for those who have asked for our prayers today, whether for healing, help, or comfort. We pray especially for Sammy, Michael, Verona, Agatha, Ashton, Lloyd, Erica, Bob, and Patsy. We pray for Maureen, Arthur, Doug, Jesse. We pray for Wanda and Savannah. We pray for Duncan and Ryan. We pray for Les. And we pray especially for those known only to yourself and those whom we hold close in our own hearts. We also remember this morning Kathy Anderson, and we pray for her family. We pray for Everett and their daughters, Jamie and Karen, and their families as they mourn at this time. We pray, Lord, that it may please thee to relieve and protect them all. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for all whom we have injured or offended. We pray to you, Lord. We pray for grace to amend our lives and to further the reign of God. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites us to his table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all of your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us share with one another a sign of God's peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace. Peace be with you. Our offertory hymn today, 
Well, we're, we're uh, going to be taking our offering in a second. Our practice is to just now have the plate at the back so we don't pass it. Uh, if you missed your opportunity to give and you'd like to, you can always leave it in the mailbox on your way out, and uh, it always gets included in the daily count. Thank you so much for your partnership and mission. We could not do it without you. Our offertory hymn is number 607, Come Let Us to the Lord Our God. I wondered if that was a typo when I saw that, but it's actually one the, the first line of the song, which is half of a sentence. That's why it sounds a little strange. Anyways, we're singing verses 1, 2, 3, 5, and 6. Please stand. Gracious God, we know your power to triumph over weakness. May we who ask forgiveness be ready to forgive one another. In the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. Amen. If you are physically able, I invite you to remain standing and through the Eucharistic prayer until the Holy, 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 after which I invite you to kneel. <clears throat> The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of heaven and earth. We give you thanks and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was tempted in every way, yet did not sin. By his grace, we are able to triumph over every evil and to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for him who died for us and rose again. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and all who have served you in every age, we raise our voices 
to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord most high. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the We give thanks to you, Lord, our God, for the goodness and love you have made known to us in creation, in calling Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you, in him you have brought us from error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night that he was handed over to suffering and death, a death he freely accepted, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, according to his command, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son and his sacrifice that we, made acceptable in him, may be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And in the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ and make them new, and bring us to that city of light where you dwell with all your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Let us sing together the Lord's Prayer.
communion, communion in Christ's, Christ's body, body once broken. broken. Let your church be the wheat which bears its fruit in dying. If, if we, we have, have died, died with him, we shall live with him. If we hold, hold firm, we shall reign with him. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Those of you who are joining in online or by telephone, uh, I guess it's hard on telephone to read what's on the screen, but uh, you're welcome to pray a prayer of spiritual communion during this time since you're not able to partake physically. Uh, as well, anyone who's present here who is not feeling as though it's right for them to receive at this point, you're welcome to pray this prayer as well. Uh, we do distribute the common cup now, and so we will be bringing the bread and the wine to the front, and we'll have a single line uh, of people that will come for bread and then wine. But if you prefer not to have the common cup, when you come to the cup, just cross your hands over your chest. Communion in one kind is a full communion, so feel free to do that. And uh, we will commune the liturgical party up front first before we begin our communion hymn. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven body of Christ broken for you, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven, the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation.
May we who share this sacrament live together in unity and peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. Amen. In the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Please remain seated for a few announcements. All of our weekly announcements go out in our Friday newsletter. And if you're not on our distribution list, I invite you to send an email to our office. We'd love to include you. Every week we have a Tuesday update from our diocese, highlighting some announcements from around the diocese. I'll leave those to you uh, to read those. As we are starting up our coffee hour again this uh, last week, we have uh, people signed up, starting to sign up to uh, put the coffee on and stuff. Erica Olson has graciously offered to do that for us today. And so there is coffee in the hall following the service. If you'd like to linger, please avail yourself of that. Also in the email are some information from our annual general meeting about a month ago. There are some draft minutes, as well as some notes from the discussion that we had about visioning for this upcoming year. I invite everyone to read those. And if you have any thoughts or additions to make, we would love to hear them. They are guiding some of the activities we'll be doing over this year. Uh, Tuesday is quickly turning into a uh, action-packed community day. We, have, uh, we had our first Tuesday men's coffee at uh, 10 o'clock at the South Service Road, Tim Hortons, and we've decided to continue with those. So everyone, any, any men uh, are welcome to join. We have lots of groups that women are involved in, but uh, there is a lack of opportunities for men to connect. So I invited people last week and we had five guys out. We didn't have any burger and fries, but we had uh, lots of caffeination and fellowship. So. I invite you to join us this Tuesday at 10 at the South Service Road, Tim Hortons. And then we do have a, a opportunity to pray with and for one another at 12.30 on Tuesdays. That's not in person, that's just by Zoom or telephone though. And the access instructions there are in the uh, newsletter. Coming up on Thursdays through Lent, we have our ministerial Lenten services. 
you can access those either in person at Eastside Church or online through the link there in the bulletin. And uh, I am leading the one on March 31st. Kevin Snyder from Eastside and I are going to be doing a joint presentation on reconciliation and in ecumenical relationships. And so I invite you to come to that and the others. We are moving forward with our plans for a church ski day out at Cyprus. If you would like to come, it's on Friday, March 31st. There's no school that day, so I'll be taking my kids and uh, Sieberts and Harmses will be coming along. Anyone else is welcome to join. Our Sunday school has uh, been doing great. We have some awesome teachers and grandparent helpers, but we are in need of a few more grandparent helpers. We had to, uh, a couple of folks had to um, drop off the, the regular rotation because of some health concerns. And so if you would like to uh, spend a little time with our kids, uh, you get out of listening to the sermon. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but anyways, uh, we do need a few more people on the rotation. There's no preparation needed. All you have to do is go out with the Sunday school kids and lend a hand wherever it's needed during that time. Finally, uh, I'm sure most of you have already heard, but a beloved member of our congregation, Kathy Anderson, passed away last week, and her funeral is just tomorrow at 1 p.m. here in the church. Uh, Kathy was not very old, but she was well-loved and uh, been here a long time, she and her husband Everett, and uh, undoubtedly it'll be a, a, one of the larger funerals we've had in quite a while. Uh, you're invited to either come here in person or access it online through the same link that you use to access our Sunday services. We're using the same thing. So just do what you do. If you're online, if you're at home or on telephone, you can phone in or uh, online at 1 p.m. tomorrow and you'll be able to access the funeral. There is a reception in the hall following uh, the funeral. Thank you to our ACW for putting that on and there'll be a light lunch provided. Uh, Everett has been quite involved as a Sunday school grandparent here and there through the years. And they've been involved in helping our Sunday school by hosting uh, some of the leaders for our Crosstalk uh, Vacation Bible School a couple times, and uh, just been generally a great support to our uh, young families in Sunday school. Um, so I'm actually, we're gonna take our kids out of school that tomorrow afternoon and have them come and be a part of it. It's important to uh, provide opportunities to have soulful conversations uh, with our kids about these kinds of things. So I don't know if it works for any of our Sunday school families, but um, you might want to think about it. And that is all of our announcements for today, apart from uh, Kathy really liked the altar rail, the communion rail. And we had been talking uh, and leadership about, you know, progressively going back to certain things that changed under COVID. And so after this service, I'd like to invite any able-bodied folks that would like to help move those uh, altar rails back into place. They're pretty big. Um, they've been in the hall for two years now. So we're gonna try to get them back here and get things set up for the funeral. And then we're actually going to keep them uh, going forward as far as we can tell. And we will get back to kneeling at the altar rail for communion. And I know every time I've brought it up to somebody, uh, they've said, oh yeah, I really missed that. So I hope it's well received. Um, yeah, God bless us all as we all mourn Kathy's loss tomorrow. And uh, let us continue our service of worship with our recessional hymn, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. The lyrics will be on your screen.
to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. Amen.